it's not an uncommon thing to come across people who track different elements. They put them in spreadsheets, Excel, graphs. They put them in all kinds of different ways as they track these different metrics to try to identify trends and patterns over time. This happens everywhere in any way you can think about it. You think about the economy or the housing market. You think about political strategies and changes. You think about the stock market. You think about markers for different diagnoses of disease. All of it is marking and, and, and creating patterns and trends of different things that are identifiable and measurable. And what these people do who study them is they look for correlations. When column A moves this direction, column B moves this direction with it or moves conversely against it. These different types of markers and trackings are all over our lives. That's how they decide what commercials to put on television. That's how they decide which vaccines to develop and mass produce. It's how political politicians make their platforms. It's another issue. Paul has recognized some trend lines for the church. Here in the book of Colossians, as we've been studying for these last several months, Paul has recognized some trend lines for the church. He recognizes that as we see our sins, there is a direct correlation to how we see the Savior. We're here in Colossians chapter 2. The middle of Colossians chapter 2, Paul is full frontal assault on the false teachings that are invading the church at Colossae. That was his motivation for writing. He wrote this letter because the church at Colossae was under attack from false teachers who were proclaiming ideas that were contrary to the gospel. And here in the middle of chapter 2, he's been dealing with the, the pluralism of their day, that Jesus is just another option amongst a whole host of options. And he's also dealing with the legalism of their day. People saying that Jesus is great, but if you don't do X, Y, and Z, a lot of them enforcing the old covenant law, then you're not really, you haven't really made it. You're not truly a Christian or, or there's a better way if you'll just add these things on to what you believe. And Paul is saying no. That's not who Jesus is. That's not how you learned about Christ. And he's arguing that in, our, in and of ourselves, we can do nothing to make God happy with us. Our good efforts, our best efforts can do nothing because we are spiritually dead before a holy God. If you have a Bible, I hope you've turned to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, you turn your Bible on or open it up, either way. And Colossians chapter 2, we're looking today at verses 13, 14, and 15 of Colossians chapter 2. The words will be on the screen here beside me. Follow along as I read aloud. Hear the word of the Lord. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is the word of the Lord. Paul is after us seeing the supremacy of Christ. He's after us seeing the greatness of Christ. And he realizes the trend lines. The deeper we see the whole of our sin, the depths, the pit, the lostness of our sin, the greater we see the rescue of Jesus. And he's painting this for us in vivid display here today. The main point I want you to see is that God has made you alive with Christ. Christ. God has made you alive with Christ. The first thing we need to recognize is what Paul just straight out of the gate declares. You were dead in your sins. You were dead in your sin. This is not one of those fuzzy passages that often gets like crocheted on pillows. I, I, you know, you go to the Christian bookstore or you look at the Christian gift shop and it's like, it's like and you were dead in your trespasses. Thrown there on the couch. 
Nice wedding gift blanket. Dead in trespasses. There you go. It's, it doesn't get a lot of press in those type of scenarios. It's not framed for us to hang on our walls. But Paul does not mince words here. He comes out and declares humanity is dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of the flesh. Now, last week, we talked for a a good length about this idea of uncircumcision of the flesh. He's dealing right here with the metaphor that circumcision had had come to take in this this day and age of dealing with our ungodliness, our, our being bent naturally in the flesh towards sin and wrongdoing. Our propensity to do the wrong thing. From the context, as we saw last week, he's not speaking of physical circumcision here. He's using it as a metaphor for the putting off of ungodliness. And he's saying, we have failed to do that. We as humanity have failed to put off ungodliness. Rather, we have embraced ungodliness. And he's saying that we have this natural bent towards sin that has left us completely lost and dead in our sin. Added to this, he adds the word trespass. We've all seen the signs. No trespassing. No trespassing, violators will be shot. You know, there's all kinds of different derivations of the no trespassing sign. But we tend to think of those, at least I do, as, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. It's a big faded sign. No, the last person who saw that sign was 100 years ago. Yeah, it's no big deal. We tend to think of trespassing as this like minor infraction. But that's not the language of the text. The language here of the text is the idea of to step beyond or to go beyond. It's the idea, it's not a fairly light offense, but it is to go against God. Many translators translate this word directly as sin. And sin is any word or deed that goes against the will of God. Any word or deed that goes against God. From all of this, the Apostle Paul renders the verdict that you and me and everyone else are by nature spiritually dead. Spiritually dead is a clear category in the Bible. You say, well, spiritually dead, I, I don't feel very dead today. I got up, I'm moving around, I, I, don't, I don't feel very dead today. So what is this spiritually dead versus spiritually alive, physically dead, physically? How, how does that even work? It's a clear category in the Bible. If we were to read through the Bible, and we'll look at a couple passages here in just a second, we see that even though someone on the outside may look very much alive, they could be very much spiritually dead. Ephesians 2, as our musicians read for us just a bit earlier in our service, Ephesians 2, Paul lays this out again in verses 1 and 2, "...and you were dead in your trespasses and sins." in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. It echoes this passage that in our sins we are spiritually dead. What does that look like? What does that mean? Paul goes on in chapter 4 of Ephesians to give us a little bit of an idea of this. He says this, They, referring to those who are spiritually dead, are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So you've got several things going on there. They're darkened in their understanding. They cannot see clearly what it is to know who God is and what he requires. They're darkened in their understanding. They're alienated. They're separated from the life of God because they cannot see and understand who God is. And it's all due to the hardness of their own heart. When you think about it, that makes a whole lot of sense. Because dead people don't respond very well to things. Dead people don't tend to react well when they encounter different situations. People who are dead don't tend to respond at all. Verse 19, they have become callous. And have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. You see, spiritual deadness is one who cannot hear and understand the word of God and thus cannot turn and save himself. Those who are spiritually dead must first be brought to life. 
That is the urgent necessity of this passage. Those who are spiritually dead must be brought to life. Spiritual death goes even further because it brings eternal judgment. Look with me back at verse 13 and 14 in Colossians. And you were who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Notice this. Our spiritual deadness comes with the fact that we have a record of debts that stand against us. That's the language of the text. It's a legal term. It's a legal idea. He's saying there is, there is a record of debt stacked against you which require mandatory sentences. The language here pictures a list, like a record. Someone making a long list of every deed you've ever done. That's a little terrifying. Yeah, yeah it is. God keeps lists. God pays attention. He is not off somewhere ignorant of what is going on in your life or in mine. He is aware fully of all of your actions, your motives, your thoughts, your words. God is not somehow disconnected. And every single one of these actions, every wrong you have ever committed, is standing in the courts of heaven as as judgments against you. This is the language of the text. And these sins carry legal guilt culpability they demand judgment in the perfect justice of god no sin can ever go unpunished you know in our world we often see protest against judges and and courts when when the verdict that they render seems unjust when it seems wrong, whether it's by perception or actually is unjust, there are often protests or people saying, remove them from the bench, get rid of them. This is not right. This is unjust. And this is in our flawed system of justice, we see this. We have enough sense of justice in and of ourselves to recognize what is, what is good justice, what is bad justice. And when we look at it across the board, we can, we can tell the difference. Is God's justice worse than ours? Is God's perfect sense of justice worse than ours? He's the creator and ruler of all things. His justice is absolutely perfect. But here's the kicker. We often want perfect justice when we've been offended. You ever notice that? Somebody dinks my car in the parking lot. I want full, I want the whole thing repainted. But if I'm the one who dinks somebody's car in the parking lot, Oh, let me just buff that out for you real quick. <sighs> See, when, when we have been offended, we want full, complete justice, sir. But when we're the offender, oh, we want mercy. We want leniency. We want, we, we want some, a light sentence. See, the problem is that this record of debt that stands against us, according to the scripture, is not due a light sentence. Romans chapter 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. In Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death. This is what is rightly owed all of our sins. It's as though you were mired in quicksand. You've seen probably TV specials, quicksand, or or seen that. Hopefully you've never experienced it. But you're mired in quicksand, and, and, and every time we struggle, every effort we move to wiggle, to try, to try to loosen ourselves, to try to get out, all it does is pull us deeper down into the quicksand. You are stuck, unable to free yourself, and every effort that you make to try to fix the problem only makes it worse. On our own, By nature, every one of us 
was lost in this dire state. But don't worry, it gets worse. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 describes to us the weapons of those against us. He, referring to God, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. What we see here is that the main weapon of Satan and his demons, these rulers and authorities being referred to here, the only weapon they have to condemn you is not of their own power, but is an echo of the judgment, the perfect righteous judgment of God against your sin. They have no power to condemn you except to declare what God has declared in perfect judgment against your sin. When our first parents were tempted and fell into their sin, Genesis chapter 3, if you want to look it up, Adam and Eve in the garden, deceived by the serpent who we find out just a few chapters later is the devil. Deceived. The devil is there not with any power to condemn Adam and Eve. Rather, it is the judgment of God that falls on Adam and Eve. But the power of the enemy is to joyfully throw the condemnation of God into the faces of Adam and Eve. Satan has no power or weapon to condemn you. We have to realize this. Satan is not down there trying to snatch people for himself as though he has power to condemn you. The condemnation comes as the just do for our sins. All he has is the justice of God which demands death for sin. And against many he wields it with reckless abandon, waving it, bringing hopelessness and depression, guilt and self-loathing, even a hatred of life itself. Oh, but against others. He deceives and he lightens or lessens our view of the wrath of God. He lessens our view of what true justice is before God. And, and, and to those whom he deceives in this way, he, he encourages them by thinking that our efforts can make up for our mistakes, which leaves us frantically trying to be perfect or pridefully deceived, thinking we might actually be so. Back to the picture of being mired in quicksand. If you are mired in quicksand, it is as though the devil and his demons are around you cheering on your efforts to try to get out yourself. Keep kicking, it's helping. Ha, ha, ha. Keep wiggling, it might free you as you sink deeper and deeper and deeper. And telling others that they are hopelessly stuck without any hope, and you might as well just sink your head into it and give up. These are the weapons of our enemy. As he comes with vicious attack, not with the power to condemn, but wielding the judgment of God over your head. By nature, this is our sad state. Every one of us, without exception, we are born spiritually dead by nature and by choice. We are sinners against God. All humanity is. God is the perfect ruler of this world. He made this world in absolute perfection. And yet our first parents chose to sin against God. And every one of us since then have been guilty of sin against a holy God. It's his house. We live in it. It's his rules. We don't get to change the rules. The bad news of the Christian gospel is that our sins deserve eternal death. We are spiritually dead and left in that state. It will result in eternal death and judgment before a holy God. Your sins against your maker rightly deserve this end. But notice in verse 13, the you. And you who were dead in your trespasses. The you here is significant. 
because we define that you based upon the context and that you is is based out of verse 6 where he says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So the you here is the same. It is to Christians. Paul is writing to Christians. And oh, take encouragement, Christian. Because it's, and you were. Hear the past tense. And you were. This was your state. Believer, by trusting in Jesus, Christ has brought the dead to life. But here this morning, if you are searching, if you're trying to figure out what this Christianity thing is all about, or if you know, walking in here, that you are not a Christian, that you have never trusted in Jesus, the past tense does not apply to you. You're still spiritually dead in your sins. And this is a grave and hopeless position, save but for the fact that the gospel literally means good news. Good news to those who are hopelessly mired in the death of their sins. God promises to bring the dead to life. John Newton, he was the author of, of Amazing Grace, popular song that most of us, I'm sure, could sing the first verse without even trying to look up the words. He said this late in life. He says, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner. And Christ is a great Savior. Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. We all were dead in our sins. But here's the second point. God has made you alive with Christ. God has made you alive with Christ. Look at these verses again with me. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. You were made alive with Christ. Notice a couple things here. Without Christ, there is no rescue from sin. Without Christ, there is no bringing the dead to life. Without Christ, we have nothing. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, these well-known words as he's declaring to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only Jesus can bring the dead to life because only Jesus conquered death. You see, that, that, that's an important fact for us to wrap our minds around. We cannot trust anyone else to rescue us from death unless they have conquered death themselves. And as we look across the scope of history, there's no one who has done that for themselves other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The passage goes on to beautifully unpack how God has made us alive together with Christ. Fo follow the logic here of the passage with me because it, 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 it will heighten your love for Jesus. He says in verse 13, And you who were dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses 
How is it that you are brought to life in Christ? God has forgiven you all your trespasses. These are the same trespasses that left us dead in our sins. Now forgiven in Jesus Christ. So how has he forgiven us? How is it that these trespasses can be forgiven? Look at verse 14. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That stack of records in the courts of heaven listing everything you've ever done against God. The language here says he blotted it out. Picture big fat eraser with little skinny pencil. Picture the whiteboard with the dry erase marker. He blotted it out. There is no record left. He is blotted out along with the demands of justice against you. See, this this doesn't sound like justice, though. Because if, if a judge here in Broward County were to look at someone who was caught on camera committing a heinous crime and to say, well, we're just going to blot that out, never happened. It, we would be up in arms. What is this? It's unjust. We can't have this. This is not right. It doesn't sound like justice. The courts of heaven would cry foul. But look at verse 14 again. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He set it aside. Literally, he moved it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. Isaiah chapter 53. Hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, speaking of who the Messiah would be, said this. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, literally his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity, the sinfulness, the guiltiness, the wickedness of us all. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made Christ to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Romans 8, chapter 3. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. And Galatians chapter 3. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Theological terms here is the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. Substitute. He took your place. He stood in when it was your turn. Atonement. Your debts are paid in Him and you receive His righteous reward. There is a uniting together in the death of Jesus. The text here says that God nailed your sins to the cross. Now 
And that happened through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. His death was for you. That your sins might be paid. He stepped in and took your place so that perfect justice would be carried out and lavish mercy and grace and forgiveness might be given. Your sins were nailed to the cross in the body of Jesus. He suffered the wrath of God against your sins in your place as your substitute if you trust in Him. You will stand before God. And when the books are open, the records are read, it will say, paid in full. One of the lessons parents have to teach their children is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. The phrase has been around. I looked it up. I was curious. About 100 years, this phrase has been floating around. Sometimes it is uh, abbreviated as tinstapel. Take the first letter of every word of the sentence, you get tin stopple, which sounded kind of cool. It's used in all kinds of different scenarios. In economics, tin stopple. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If you take it from somewhere, it's got to come from somewhere else. It's, it's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Someone always pays. In the science world, it's been used to describe the laws of thermodynamics, the fact that energy is never created or destroyed. If you cre- pull it somewhere, it's got to be pulled from somewhere else. The basic principle of justice. For every crime, there is a consequence. But in our fallen world, rarely is there an adequate justice to make up for the crime. But in God's eternal system, in the economy of God, forgiveness is not free, but His perfect justice is seen. It's seen in the fact that Christ died perfectly for your sins and for mine. In Christ's work on the cross, perfect justice is achieved and perfect forgiveness is offered. Every sin for everyone who would ever believe perfectly and fully paid so that God can be just and offer that forgiveness. John Newton wrote another lesser known hymn called Let Us Love and Sing and Wonder. In one of the later stanzas, he penned this. Let us wonder grace and justice. Join and point To mercy's store. When through grace. In Christ our trust is. Justice smiles. And asks no more. Justice is not often pictured as smiling. Until it's complete. Until it's balanced. Until it's done. There is no injustice in the forgiveness of God. There is full and complete justice and full and complete forgiveness in the cross of Jesus Christ. Christian, rejoice in the great sacrificial love of Christ. Friend, if you're here today, hear the good news of the gospel. Turn from trusting yourself. Turn from trying to figure it out on your own and believe in what Jesus has done. Trust that His death was enough to pay your debts and rest in that hope for eternity. God bids you come and live. Turn and trust in Christ today. Verse 15 adds a layer of context we don't often see. Look at verse 15 once again. He, that is God, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. God 
disarmed the rulers and authorities. Again, this refers to Satan and his legion of demons. He disarmed them by taking away the only thing that they had for your condemnation, your guilt and culpability of sin. The only thing they could do is throw your sins in your face and say, you are guilty. But in Christ, there is no guilt left. In Christ, forgiveness is full. God has defanged the serpent. He has blunted the sword of the devil. He has taken the ammo from Satan's gun. If you are trusting in Christ, there is no condemnation that can be brought against you. Romans 8 captures this beautifully. The Apostle Paul writing again, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. God has disarmed the enemy. And he has publicly humiliated him through the cross of Christ. We we don't live in a shame culture. There are other shame cultures in our world. We don't tend to live in that. uh, Most of our shame is thrown on YouTube. We don't live in a shame culture. But, But think, Like the old cartoon of Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam. You you get a little picture there. Because Bugs Bunny always comes against Yosemite Sam. Yosemite Sam is blowing and going with his guns and his crazy hair and all this stuff. And by the end, Yosemite Sam is disarmed and usually disrobed, left out in the open. This is what God has done to the enemy. You see, in the cross... When Satan saw what would be his greatest victory, God was working his eternal defeat. In the cross of Christ, when Satan saw what should be his moment of triumph, God was working his eternal destruction. Genesis 3. Right after the fall comes the judgment of God upon both the serpent and the woman, and the man. In the condemnation to the serpent, the Lord said to the serpent, Genesis three fourteen, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. The word bruise there is often translated crush. God promised way back in Genesis 3 to crush the head of the snake. And in the cross, we see open in public, the head of the snake is crushed in the cross of Jesus Christ. Christian, do not believe the devil's lies. He has no deadly weapon against you. All of his attacks are seen for what they are in light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said this, When the devil throws our sins up to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? I love that. What of it? Does this mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal condemnation? By no means. For I know one who has suffered and made a satisfaction in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he is, there I shall be also. Marvel today at the great work of Jesus on your behalf. Rest, Christian, in the fact that he has finished 
perfectly, fully, and eternally the payment for all of your sins, past, present, and future in His cross. Don't live in condemnation for sins that Jesus has forgiven you. Do not live daily under the weight of guilt for sins which Christ has set you free. In Christ you have been given life. You have been made alive. Do not take this life and live for the things of death. Do not take this life and live in our sins. But this life is to be lived in the freedom of gratitude and joy in following Jesus. If you're here today and you have never trusted in Jesus, turn and trust Him today. Find the forgiveness that He offers so perfectly to you. Let His perfect forgiveness rain down In your life today. You see Paul had tracked the correlations. He knew that for us to see. The supremacy and greatness of Jesus. More clearly. It requires us to see the depths. Of our sins. And our need for forgiveness. Here today. The greater you see your sin. The more magnificent you will see your savior. Look at the depths of your sin, not to wallow in it, not to get mired in it, not to feel the condemnation of it, but look at the depths of your sin so that you will see the greatness of your rescue. Christian, savor the greatness of Jesus. And friend, if you have not trusted in Jesus, beware of the deadness of your sins. Repent. Turn from trusting yourself and trust the forgiveness of Jesus. This happens by praying, by talking to God and asking Him, confessing that you have sinned against Him and asking Him for His forgiveness. He has promised that everyone who calls on Him in the name of Jesus will be saved. In Jesus, God has made you Father, thank you that those who are in Christ are no longer dead in sin. But that you have made us alive. You have brought rescue. Lord, help us to see the magnitude of the rescue of Jesus. And help that understanding to drive us to love you more and more each day. Father, protect us. Free us from living with the guilt of sins that are forgiven in Christ. Lord, whatever you need to apply to the hearts of those here today, I pray that you would do it. I pray that you would give us boldness to respond to you. To respond to your word. To trust you more fully, more faithfully. To love you more deeply because of the power of your word today. Be magnified now as we respond to you. In Jesus' name.